Good morning. I know it was uh, pretty tough to get here this early. So um, thank you all uh, to our fantastic panel. Um, we've been brainstorming some cool and topical questions. Uh, and we're going to start with the one that um, we've heard a lot about in the press, which is the 51% problem. And um, what about it? Is it a problem? Do we need to worry about it? Uh, yes. <laughs> and feel free to elaborate. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, it is definitely a problem. It is, uh, once you reach 50%, uh, you tend to be a single point of failure. And uh, that's, that's pretty much true in many systems, but especially in a consensus or distributed system. Um, in particular, uh, you can reverse transactions, you can uh, create a double spending attack if you're a malicious actor, but uh, also there is the counter incentives in that uh, once you uh, perpetuate some of those attacks, then uh, the Bitcoin community presumably would become aware and uh, want to address that in a direct or rather direct sort of way. But so yes, short answer, it is a problem. So let me add something to this. Um, and Jeff mentioned the attacks that are possible with the 51% uh, miner. But uh, it's also quite, the problem with 51% isn't so much that somebody will achieve 51% and then attack the network. 51% is a problem for the perception of Bitcoin as a decentralized system. The moment you have a miner that has achieved a monopoly, then the ability to distinguish uh, Bitcoin from any other single issue currency uh, gets lost. So we suddenly lose the ability to bring new people in. We suddenly lose the value proposition that Bitcoin offers. The thing that actually attracted all of us to this space was decentralization. So even if a 51 percenter is on their best behavior, even if there are no attacks against the system, even if there are no double spends, 51 percent is actually a net loss for the community at large. So it is something that I feel very strongly that we should so, take measures against. So what can we do about it? And is there a short-term and a long-term fix? We haven't heard from Peter yet. So. Well, I think in the short term, um, there's a lot of education to be done, not of the community, but really of the people who are, say, mining at ghash.io to make sure they better understand what their incentives are. Because if you have a long-term viewpoint on Bitcoin, you should not be part of ghash.io right now. You, know, you should be part of a smaller pool. And then beyond that, well, then I think it's a very clear indication that we need to go fix the protocol. And there's a whole host of technical solutions. And it will take time to kind of evaluate them, better understand them, try them out on test networks and so on. But long term, that's probably going to be what we'll see happen. And, and Gun has a, a proposal for a technical solution as well, which yep. will need to be evaluated. Yep. Yeah, right. indeed. Uh, Itai Eyal and I have come up with a solution called two-phase proof of work uh, that actually is very nice in the sense that it accommodates the current mining rings, the current mining infrastructure as it exists, uh, but allows us to actually push back. And um, I wouldn't say that it's anywhere near ready. We need to still uh, get some experience with it. Uh, but it's very nice to have those kinds of technical solutions in our back pocket as we discuss us, uh, with, say, a 51 percenter and say, look, guys, you're actually hurting the community and there are technical measures we can take in the medium to long term to actually push back against 51 percenters. And uh, so we're actually in an okay position when it comes to this, that we have some technical solutions that we could deploy if we wanted to. And so is there a short term fix? Can we do something tomorrow to to uh, get us out of the, of the problem? Well, the pool can do something tomorrow. We, as a collective community, can't really do anything immediately tomorrow. But I also uh, like to point out that you know, there, there are technical solutions, there are uh, education, but there's also just simple free market. And free market competition and the interest of the Bitcoin community in mining pools really incentivizes people to look at the 51% issue and say, okay, I'm going to switch pools. So in terms of uh, uh, market leadership, I like to point out that pools rapidly change market leadership. We've hit 51% multiple times before GHash. And each time, if you observe the mining pools over uh, you know, periods of months and then years, you see market leadership just rapidly recycles. It's not just one player. It's one player, and then it's a second player, and then it's a third player. And so uh, you really have a very, very dynamic competitive system. So to summarize, 
in the long term, we'll have a technical fix and we're, we'll evaluate all of yes. them. But in the short term, we need the community to be more careful about where they mine and to spread their mining ar about. And we also need the mining pools to take more responsibility for their actions. Absolutely. Okay, great. So um, now, um, a slightly more controversial one even. So <laughs> mining is the cost of securing the network. And currently mining is 140 petahash approximately, which today is about 140 um, megawatts of power. But um, the cost of mining is related to the cost of Bitcoin and the block reward. So when, when Bitcoin price gets higher, are we gonna spend many megawatts or even gigawatts one day on our mining? And is that reasonable? Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We have to secure our network, but uh, I think it's only a valid comparison if you uh, compare what it takes to secure a uh, traditional currency, both in terms of multi-million dollar printers, inks, for to secure the physical currency, the cost of the data centers, and remember, uh, Bitcoin is not just currency, it's a payment network. And so you have to consider the cost of securing a uh, comparative pay payment network on top of securing the currency. So, you know, for the US dollar, you have uh, secret service agents, US treasury agents, you have data centers, and you have multi-million dollar printers, inks, et cetera. All of that has to be factored into the comparative equation. And so, if you consider all of that, there's a great deal of energy wasted in securing the US dollar. And you know, that big number, can be a little misleading because in the future, and we're already beginning to see it as well, we'll be seeing things like people using Bitcoin mining equipment to go heat their houses, you know, yeah, and make use of all this extra heat, maybe. as well as, curiously enough, put Bitcoin mining equipment in more decentralized ways because renewable energy is very cheap, except for the fact they have to get it from the middle of nowhere to cities. Of course, with Bitcoin mining equipment, people are already beginning to go put the Bitcoin mining equipment where the energy is generated which kind of changes economics, and it's not as simple as saying, oh yeah, this must be generated by dirty coal. Yeah, there's a lot of Bitcoin mining now in Iceland where yep. they have almost free energy with geothermal and very cold ambient temperature, yep. so cooling is free as well. So. And that's one of the business ideas I love to toss off is a uh, mining water heater. Yep. So I don't use that phrase in England. <laughs> <laughs> it means something different. <laughs> uh, great, okay. So um, what's happening with uh, the Bitcoin core development? Um, where's it going? What are the issues? Well, uh, uh, basically, uh, Bitcoin core development, I'll just give sort of a general overview. Uh, coming from the Linux kernel open source space, I try to draw a lot of analogies from that. Bitcoin is an open source project, and uh, the Bitcoin protocol itself changes to that are modeled after the IETF RFC process. It's called a BIP or Bitcoin improvement proposal. And so if you're going to change the protocol, then you'll follow a standard process where you'd uh, create an implementation, write up a draft specification, then you'd engage the community in that regard. Um, in terms specifically of Bitcoin development, um, there, there's no entrance exam, there's, there's no qualification. All you have to do is show up and start contributing. Now, if you show up and start contributing at a sort of either low knowledge or low quality level, then you'll take a longer time to build trust with the existing programmers and the existing community. But if you show up, and this, this happens both in the Linux kernel and in Bitcoin, you show up, you know your stuff, you're a genius, your changes are, uh, are perfect, then uh, they'll be instantly accepted. And but we so, have a problem, Peter, though. There's, uh, you, got, you two are core developers, but there's not enough core developers, are there? I think that's an education issue. I think it's just the number of people who really understand the protocol is extremely small. And that's a problem. Yeah, it is a problem. And it's not a problem that you go fix by you know, creating a group negotiating access to core protocols. It's probably fixed by teaching people. 
Yeah, that has to happen naturally and, and organically, I think. But one nice thing that's happening outside the development community in the research community that I can speak to is uh, there are a lot of academics now actually taking a more critical look at uh, Bitcoin, who are excited about Bitcoin, who are excited about a, the opportunities of the It's a cryptographer's blockchain. dream, isn't it, to like it study is, Bitcoin? It is, indeed. It's, it's suddenly put cryptography uh, you know, front, square, and center. And um, so that's really exciting. And, um, and there are a lot of young, bright minds who actually have, uh, are very excited. So that I think there's good organic growth in that. But also, I mean, BitPay um, has effectively paid for you to be um, full-time core development, but there are a few other companies that are doing the same thing. So we, you know, we need to encourage that. Absolutely, uh, and we need not only education, but uh, <clears throat> other Bitcoin companies uh, need to not get into the mode of thinking where if they want something, they come to the core developers. That's not how open source works. If you want something done, you need to hire the developers to do it, and your developers will then become your interface into the Bitcoin community. I mean, As right now, we have so few core developers that uh, it's simply not scalable to add task upon task. You need to scale horizontally and add more developers. So, uh, uh, a lot of businesses are, uh, are just floating, just starting in the community, and they need to learn uh, that you know, either you need to hire some developers yourself, or there are, uh, for example, the Bitcoin Foundation does uh, fund uh, three core developers right now as well, and so contributing to the Bitcoin Foundation also contributes to core development. But every company should, uh, particularly every company that's raised finance, should have in their business plan to at least um, you know, contribute a core developer, not just poach a core developer from another company, but actually create a new core developer. Uh, absolutely, and also it's important to note that development isn't just a single, uh, single sort of stage of a, of, of a process. It's really a pipeline. You need research and development. So um, uh, I think we saw with the selfish mining discovery that indeed uh, there are some issues that are higher than we need to write some code. That somebody needs to think about, well, what are the dynamics of this distributed system? What do we need to anticipate ahead? And uh, these are not easy, easy issues, and it really takes a, a research pipeline then followed by a development pipeline. Absolutely so. and uh, to steal some of uh, something that Peter Todd said uh, a couple days ago in response to something I said in Twitter, <laughs> um, we often compare Bitcoin to medical device software or avionics software because it's to such a level that it simply can't fail. But Bitcoin is a binary uh, equation in that it's either worth zero or non-zero. You know, maybe that's self-evident, but if you think about the reverse of if there's a break, then it'll quickly go to zero. So um, it's, it's very, very high level software that just has to work, but it also is under-researched. And so we're, it's a dilemma in software development because when we need to advance the uh, protocol, advance the community, we really are breaking new ground. But on and the other hand, and we, we need itself. both research and development to, uh, to get us where we need to go. But Bitcoin itself has a value, so it's its, its own prize mm -hmm. to be studied and mm -hmm. to, to find security issues. Yeah. And you know, also um, put out a positive note, which is to point out that the core Bitcoin development, it doesn't necessarily, you didn't say you necessarily expect to change that much. It's not unlike, say, TCP IP. On the other hand, there's this whole ecosystem around it, which I didn't make the analogy of the web, where we do see a lot of very innovative, very fast work. And companies in the space who do things like experiment with multisig, they're pushing Bitcoin forward, even if they may not be directly working on this so called Bitcoin core software. And they deserve, I think, a lot of credit for that. So that, that's a great segue. So let's talk about multisig for a moment. Um, how important is it? And is it, is it the next generation of wallets that will make people feel safer? And um, is that, are we solved? Are we done with, with safety? It, it's absolutely necessary. Um, it's been in the Bitcoin protocol since day one. But uh, so that gives you an idea of how long it's taken to uh, develop an actual secure wallet. Um, I like to make, an, uh, not an analogy, but uh, uh, Bitcoin is really pushing the bounds of computer security, stop, period, end of, end of sentence. The, uh, 
the computer security community has never before been called upon to secure a single digital file whose theft may result in millions of dollars of value being transferred. You've had secure software before, you've had encrypted software before, but never is a file sitting on your computer been worth so much. So it, 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 it demands a whole new level of security. Multi-sig is just the first step. So Gun, in that uh, process. You wanted to comment? Yeah, so um, I like to call Bitcoin the universal bounty program. So um, in the old days, when you found a, a bug in some kind of an operating system or some kind of a platform, you'd have to prove to the platform operators that indeed this is a real serious bug, I could break into your system. They would push back on you, they'd be like, you don't really have a demonstrated exploit, we're not going to recognize your bug, and so forth. And this was a given, you know, this was uh, you know, back and forth, and it really just sort of wore everybody down. But with the invention of Bitcoin, now any hacker, as soon as he finds a zero-day vulnerability, gets to collect rewards. And this at, at, at once is both very infuriating, because you, know, you suddenly have these news reports of, oh my god, my Bitcoins are gone, somebody swept through and took them all off. But really these people are doing some, uh, 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 in some perverse way, service to the community in identifying the flaws. And, um, there really is a big issue, though, which is the platforms that we use to secure Bitcoins, both on the server side and on the client side, are typically not worthy of holding assets of such great value. And we really need to uh, take really great measures. As we to saw secure. with Mt. Gox. We, yeah. So Mt. Gox is a separate issue. So um, Mt. Gox, it's not really clear what happened. Um, but uh, there are many other exchanges that failed. And uh, there are a lot of exchanges that failed due to uh, poor server construction. Uh, similarly, there are a lot of stories of people who lost, uh, uh, lost their Bitcoins due to errors or, or flaws in the client-side software. So we really need to, to improve the state of computer security at all levels. So Peter, when, if um, wallets that have multi-sig built in become the norm, then what about the services that uh, provide value-added um, multi-sig? What happens to them? Do you need them? Or? I think you still need them. In fact, it, I'd say it becomes more interesting to use them. Because if, for instance, if I go make the promise that I will help keep your Bitcoin secure, and you will also have another part of a multi-sig wallet, it's really both of us are authorizing the transaction to happen. So if my business is to, say, run you know, security service where I'm vetting what's going on, I'm doing the auditing, and you're a company, really we've set up this arrangement where we're both participating and keep your coin secure. Yet, you can easily get into that arrangement because I can't run with your money either. And some of them have insurance policies as well, which is a exactly. nice belt and braces kind of approach. And it's a very interesting uh, problem for regulators as well, because with multi-sig, who actually controls those funds? If it's three organizations holding three keys, who legally owns those funds? And so you can't really write legislation that says, you know, these bitcoins are uh, you know, this certain legal category because it might be partially owned and partially controlled. So let's move on to um, uh, confirmation time. So in e-commerce, we need fast confirmations. We need to know that a transaction has happened. You need to be able to leave the store, um, or they need to let you leave the store knowing that they've been paid for something. Or, or if, with an ATM, when, when you make a withdrawal, you need to know that you know, you've shown your Bitcoin uh, QR code or whatever, and you need to be able to withdraw the cash. So sometimes these take a long time. What's being done to help that? Well, uh, my, my personal uh, pet project is uh, uh, payment channels. And payment channels are a uh, smart contract technology. It's a two of two multi-sig technology whereby uh, you agree to, with a server, to lock in some funds. Once the funds are locked in on the blockchain, you can securely and rapidly revise a transaction in a trustless way, such that if the server departs, the client receives their full refund. And this is guaranteed by the Bitcoin protocol. If the client departs, then the server or the merchant still has the funds up to the point where the client departed. So it's functionally an automatic settlement type mechanism. However, it can be rapidly revised. You can have four billion of these in, you know, per second in theory. So, and they're all digitally signed and they can be published on the blockchain. 
Um, that's just one example of a technique that provides instant secure transactions and you don't have to wait for a confirmation time. There are other uh, techniques out in the field that are exploring similar, uh, similar trains of thought, but uh, whenever someone says that Bitcoin is too slow because of the confirmation time, then they're, not, they're just looking at the lowest layer. They're looking at IP of TCP IP, whereas Bitcoin is many layers of an onion and you have to look at how you can build trustless systems on top of the Bitcoin protocol such that they achieve your goals. Very good. So um, what other exciting things are happening in Bitcoin Core in the next year? Let's start with Peter. Um, well, I mean, me personally, I go work for a bunch of groups that are trying to go build financial instruments on top of Bitcoin. And I think we're going to see a lot of exploration in that space. You're going to see a lot of things like people experimenting with issuances of stocks, of bonds. Um, you may have heard of the term colored coins is a very early example of this, and that's being explored. You've also got embedded consensus systems like your master coin, your counterparty, that are really, in some ways, changing the Bitcoin protocol, but for a narrow group of users. So you can have one small group of users that care about a set of rules. They can choose to follow those rules, and the rest of the Bitcoin community doesn't have to care what they're doing. And then they can accept rules that, for instance, may allow stock trading, may allow distributed markets, may allow I mean, you guys are finance people. You can think of a ton of finance instruments I'm not familiar with. But it remains to see how valuable this stuff really is in the real world. I think some of it certainly will be. Some of it won't be. And you know, we'll have a whole space of exploration. Yeah, we'll certainly see value-added services built on the blockchain. The blockchain allows us to bootstrap trust. And that's going to be an enormous enabler for a lot of services. And uh, in general, uh, there are a lot of people who are in the altcoin space who I think they, they have a, a legitimate desire in that uh, uh, the term that I use is app coin. If you have an application and you want to have some tokens, et cetera, a cryptocurrency can be a, uh, an excellent choice. But the current altcoins, that's uh, the alternative currencies that are built on uh, you know, Bitcoin code base, like Litecoin, et cetera, they are ba wildly insecure, I'll, I'll be blunt. Um, <laughs> and, and also, I mean, less and less significant. I mean, in terms of market cap, Bitcoin is, you know. Well, well just, just to finish the point is that app coins are a valid use case, but altcoins are a poor implementation of that use case. So what we're gonna see in the future is uh, side chains or tree chains, and that is a technology that allows you to bootstrap on Bitcoin's network strength, while at the same time having a totally separate chain, a totally separate currency, or even outside the currency space, a totally separate distributed database. And an example of that is Namecoin, which attempts to uh, create sort of a decentralized DNS. And Namecoin has its own problems, but as an analogy, that works, is Bitcoin is fundamentally a database technology at the end of the day. And currency is just one application that runs on that consensus database technology. So once you have other app coins which bootstrap on Bitcoin's network strength, and side chains and tree chains are two proposals that do that, then you'll see a different explosion of altcoins in the future typically running on the Bitcoin protocol, the Bitcoin blockchain. So that's another exciting development so in the future. How do features get decided for Bitcoin Core? And who's in charge? And how, you know, who decides these We're features? We're all in charge. Everybody. Yeah, but in, I, in the well, real world, you I, can't all be in charge. Well, and, I think what's interesting about it is that technologies like side chains and tree chains, a lot of what's driven the ideas behind them is this notion that it would be better off if we didn't have to ask permission. Um, and with embedded consensus systems like MasterCoin and Counterparty, as well as your colored coins, they're designed under the assumption that Bitcoin core protocol won't change. Therefore, we should go work within that protocol to come up with something new. And I think there's been a lot of success with people building on top of Bitcoin without making the assumption that all the stuff they do has to change Bitcoin itself. And that's been, I think, a very, very successful process. Whereas the proposals that assume that our, we're going to change what Bitcoin is, they kind of tend to just sit there on mailing lists because it takes so much time to get that consensus. It's not impossible, it does happen, 
We have made a few changes to Bitcoin. P2SH with multisig is an example. But it's slow, and it's not the way I personally would do things. And I think going forward, we're going to look for ways to make permissionless development more easy to accomplish so we do not have to continue changing the core Bitcoin protocol. So one last question before we open it up to the, uh, to the floor. Well, one, one okay. quick addendum, if you don't yeah. mind. I, I would uh, point out that the Bitcoin protocol was built to be extensible. Satoshi, at many levels, put in extensibility into the Bitcoin protocol. You can add new script opcodes. You can, uh, you know, uh, X the uh, transaction malleability issue, there was the uh, notion that you could piggyback some more data onto transactions. There are several other avenues of extensibility that are built into Bitcoin. And so the Bitcoin protocol itself is not just frozen in time. It moves slower than most people in the community would probably like, but when you have to be conservative with $8 billion worth of value. So what if you get to a place in the world where you have no internet? Then how would you get the blockchain? I mean, how would you? Well, what a wonderful question. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, one of my pet projects is uh, putting uh, Bitcoin in space. So uh, I am uh, I'm currently contracted with uh, Deep Space Industries. We're designing CubeSats, which will process the blockchain. Once we get the CubeSats up into space, of course, you need some governmental approval at launch time and frequency, et cetera. But once they're up into space, there's no off switch. And so if you need uh, remote access to Bitcoin, you would have the full blockchain. That's not a uh, simplified payment verification. You have full trustless verification. And also, if, uh, you know, even if you're in the Western world and well connected to the internet, et cetera, if you're Sybil attacked, you have a local attack, that's an excellent resilient backup mechanism as you can download from satellite down to Earth. So, and that's trustless. The satellite's using the same Bitcoin D algorithms to evaluate every block. So even if the ground stations that are sending the blocks up to the satellites are malicious, the Bitcoin algorithm itself guarantees that that's not going to be a, uh, an issue. And, you know, I think I can kind of generalize where you're going with the satellite to say what's really strong about Bitcoin is it's just a piece of data with an algorithm. And your ability to be secure is in part dependent on how easily you can get that data. And if you have more connections to different computers and so on, you are more secure because you're less able to be censored from what the true Bitcoin blockchain is. And that's a very powerful statement. And it really leverages what the internet is good at, which is distributing data. It's, it's so, definitely censorship resistant, but uh, uh, moving beyond satellite and generalizing a bit, it's useful to Bitcoin to find different avenues to distribute the blockchain and distribute block headers. Uh, I egged uh, Peter here on uh, months ago to <laughs> post block headers to Twitter as an example of an alternate distributive mechanism. They blocked me after a month. <laughs> Again, you had a comment on, on Jeff. Um, yeah, so I, I really respect Jeff's effort to get to the moon and, and to do that first uh, by going to outer space. Um, but uh, um, and, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful, laudable effort. Um, I do think, though, that, that we really have some issues on the ground here. So. Oh, no question, no question. So both on the server side and on the client side, I think my worries really reside with security, computer security. So it's great to get uh, the data on the blockchain and so forth, but if your processing engine is compromised, you're dead. And that's really the number one issue that I see uh, coming up ahead. Thank you. So let's uh, see if there's any questions from the audience. We have one in the front row. Uh, do we need to get a microphone to them or we'll just over here, front row? Hello, um, my name is Olivier Janssens, and I recently did like a hundred thousand dollar bounty to replace the Bitcoin Foundation. I don't know if you heard about that, um, because I think it really lacked transparency and was sort of yeah uh, no longer representing the community properly. So, as the winner was Mike Hearn with Lighthouse, and one of the main things I want to accomplish is sort of like decouple the developers from the foundation, so you're not depending on them for your wages. So I was wondering if you guys are willing to use this platform in the future to have crowdfunding uh, happen and be crowdfunded by the community. So the community can actually choose like which um, 
yeah, uh, features they want to have implemented? Well, if, if you want to choose what features to have implemented, <laughs> just hire the developers yeah. to write them. I'll point out um, Zero Cash, which is one of the projects I'm working on. We're planning on using Lighthouse to go raise funds in the future, and we're really looking forward to that. And Lighthouse is, in particular, a fantastic platform. It makes use of a uh, feature in the Bitcoin protocol whereby you can collectively build a transaction among many, many people, and it's it's a binary decision. It's not valid on the Bitcoin network until the transaction is fully funded. So if I need to raise a thousand Bitcoins and you know he contributes a Bitcoin, he contributes a Bitcoin, it's not valid until that thousand is reached. And so that uh, addresses in part the, uh, the free rider problem in, or who goes first problem in economics. Thanks. Any other questions? There's one over here. Hello, I'm Denison. Um, on the subject of education, is there any work being done to maybe do something like um, a master's degree in Bitcoin, or would you leave to work in a university setting where you just simply teach the next generation of people who are going to be working in Bitcoin? Most like definitely, I can speak to that. I think uh, there's so much interest uh, for cryptocurrencies among the young students, among the 18 to 22 crowd, that um, I'm, I know what we're doing at Cornell, and I can speak to that, our operating systems class, where students learn how to program and write systems code, uh, actually covers Bitcoin. Uh, our master's classes typically have a lecture or two on crypto uh, applications with specific application to Bitcoin. So we're certainly covering the topic, um, so a master's program in Bitcoin is a little too much, but there are master's theses being uh, written, uh, looking at different aspects of blockchain analysis, for example. And uh, there are even some uh, PhD uh, theses uh, coming out of different institutions. Uh, the UC system has a couple of people who've actually looked very closely at, uh, at um, uh, blockchain analysis. So it's certainly making its way, and it's, coming, and it's happening organically. It's, it's, we're certainly educating the next set of people who want to learn about cryptocurrencies. Yeah, I think that's, that's an excellent way to put it. It's happening organically. You see computer science uh, departments in uh, many universities that I'm familiar with are, are just sort of scrambling to catch up with this technology but uh, they will eventually have distributed consensus in most major computer science programs. But uh, what one thing I find interesting and I hope that universities pursue is that uh, Bitcoin is really a fusion of computer science, game theory, economics, et cetera, and uh, computer scientists don't typically graduate with uh, <laughs> economics you know, on, their, on their brain, and economists don't typically uh, have much background in computer science. And so I can see economics departments growing a, uh, you know, a dual major or some sort of cross-pollination between the two because cross-pollination exists in the real world. Most certainly. So me mechanism design is a topic that marries uh, both distributed systems with economics and game theory. So that's a topic that has uh, received a lot of academic attention already. And, um, and there are uh, a lot of programs that are actually looking at this. And game theory courses most certainly touch upon aspects of distributed system design, incentive compatible distributed system design. And also to point out for developers, there is developer documentation. Very good documentation recently was written up on Bitcoin.org. And that was a great effort to see happen. And in general, uh, an invitation to uh, anyone listening is I have an open email policy, jgarzik at bitpay.com. If you have an incredibly uh, complex Bitcoin question, you're more than welcome to email us or email the list or join the uh, Pound Bitcoin IRC. And we're more than happy to answer questions and mentor people into the space. We're desperate to get more developers. We want a thousand X developers of what we have now. Next question, there was one over here. Who's got the mic? Microphone, over here. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned uh, side chains. Um, I'm just interested to know, does that contribute positively to the network or does it add some unnecessary weight? I just wondered if you could speak about that a little bit more. Well, that, that's a bit of a sub subjective question, I think. the. Uh, I don't really want to form an opinion on that question. It's really a uh, matter of the community and are they paying transaction fees? Are they following the protocol? You know, the rules are really technical rather than uh, subjective. I think sidechains uh, or whatever solution 
uh, approximates that are very important because they allow us to shed some load off the Bitcoin blockchain, which is uh, useful for efficiency. But is it good? That's, that's a religious question. These things kind of come down to analysis of the incentives behind them, sort of the technical um, incentive compatibility and then what it does for minor profitability. So there is very heated debate within the Bitcoin community about it. Although to answer kind of the really broad question, regardless whether you're doing an embedded consensus system, a side chain or a tree chain system, you're all contributing towards the same 51% attack security of Bitcoin, which is different from an altcoin where you're doing something entirely separate. Next question. Oh. Is, that, is that it or do we have time for one last question? That's it. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to thank our panel, Gun, Peter, Jeff, and I'm Jeff. Thanks. Fantastic.